Please take your seats quickly, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Tennis Weekly with Joel and Kim, sponsored by DownloadTennis.com. On today's Film Club, we chat with director Barney Douglas and composer Felix White about their new documentary, McEnroe, an intimate portrayal of one of the biggest sporting icons of our time. Guys, firstly, it's great to have you on the show. Welcome to Tennis Weekly HQ. How are you both doing today? All good. Yeah, all good. Uh, in the midst of uh, the McEnroe release. So exciting times for us. <laughs> uh, it's great to be on your podcast. Thank you very much. Uh, and Felix you, uh... is looking dashing, I think, at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Barney. Good answer for me. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Bob. Have you been enjoying Wimbledon? Have you managed to get down to the courts at SW19? I haven't yet. I was hoping that, you know, John would just call me up and give me a few free tickets, but they have not been forthcoming <laughs> as yet. Um, but uh, I have been able to, I've sort of kept half an eye on what's been mm. going on. And it's just great. I mean, it's so fantastic to have obviously crowds in and, you know, mm. there's quite a bit of, there's quite a few parallels going on with some of the contro- on-court controversy mm. and some of the sort <laughs> of uh, slightly spiky press conferences with mm. um, John's time, isn't it? You know what? There was one even today. I was watching um, the doubles. I don't even know who it was, but I had because of Macra, I've had a, I've re-energized my interest a little bit. We wouldn't had it on, and there was this stuff in the doubles about them saying that the machine they didn't think the machine was working for the line calls, and then getting the yeah. thing out. It's become ev- almost every game I've watched has been like watching the Macro film again. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting you say that because you know, I watched the film. Last night, thank you for the invite. Really, really enjoyed it. And uh, one of the things I kept saying to Kim throughout the film was, is John McEnroe, is he just Nick Kyrgios back in the day? I just swear, like, it's just like, he's obviously a very heated guy, very controversial at the time. And it just, as you said, there just felt like there's so many parallels watching that. And then, yeah, seeing kind of what happened, you know, what's been happening at Wimbledon at the moment. Yeah, I think particularly culturally, I mean, us Brits, we... um you know, we certainly traditionally have liked our sport and sporting behavior a certain way. And and I think in the film, when you see McEnroe in New York and the mm. kind of chaos and the U S open crowd, and like things being lobbed and people, umpires shouting, you can, you really get a sense of then suddenly landing in, in Wimbledon when people are turning up in suits and tires and, you know, <laughs> just respecting any, any decision mm. that's made, you can really see how the, the culture clash happened. Um, but what's been really interesting to me is just, like the, the personalities really the, mm. the you're allowed to show character and you're allowed to show dissent in some ways and then you're allowed to be a, a human being basically <laughs> or i say allowed to john certainly um mm. got got flack for it but i think that's maybe something that's changed i don't know if you've noticed that felix yeah the interesting thing with the nick curious thing i think is that um the, the good thing about the McEnroe film is that he's had all this time, decades left of unpacking it and perspective to sort of work out a sense of what it was all about. So like he's got a, a, like a, mm. there's a lot of wisdom there, sort of self-wisdom from John in the film and a lot of unresolved stuff too that comes with it. But it's, it's interesting watching Nick Kyrgios because you can see sort of younger man who's right in the midst of it. Mm. So you can sort of imagine that we won't know until like 20 years later when you speak to Nick, what really that was about and what's going on in his life mm. and how what his life off the court that's feeding into that was, you know? Mm. Yeah, it's interesting because I think, you know, certainly watching the film, it, it's I think what's so fascinating and compelling about tennis is once you go on the court, it's you and you alone. And therefore I feel like people have that opportunity to to be themselves or express themselves in a way that you may not necessarily be able to do in a, in a team sport because you feel like under pressure from your teammates to act in a certain way. But you know, when you're there on your own, I feel like you, you have that opportunity to be a bit more sort of unfiltered. And certainly I think with John McEnroe, that's, that is what we got, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. But I also feel with John, he doesn't really have that filter. Um, mm. Other people self-censor and so that they appear a certain way or don't offend people or want to be, you know, perceived as being a good person or whatever it might be. I just don't think John has that filter. Mm. I think he's learned behaviours as he's gone on and learned what's become acceptable and what, what hasn't. But certainly as a young man thrown into that sort of cauldron of ultra competitive top level mm. tennis um, and feeling like everyone was against him, I think he 
the outbursts were just very certainly early on were just very natural mm. they just that was just natural reactions to it do you feel like you know obviously working you know working on the documentary working with him do you feel like as time has gone on do you feel like you know he has mellowed or do you feel like he has now got this sort of image to uphold because everyone obviously thinks back to you know his heyday and saw him on the court and do you think he how do you how do you interpret how he's changed do you feel over time since his his playing days well I think he's he's absolutely mellowed but I think what's really come through is he's found acceptance in his personal life and connection that he was always Mm. seeking as a younger man and couldn't get it um and was frustrated by that and felt probably alienated by that and I think now he's just at a stage in life where he does have it and he can be himself and he's understood um by his partner Patty and he has mellowed and I think but what's come with that is an ability to showcase his humor a bit more which he was never really able to do as a younger man he didn't know how to express that I don't think in the right way he says in the film I was trying to say something funny and it would come out wrong you know Mm. um so I definitely think all those things have contributed to where he is now and he he is still authentic he's still who he is I don't don't think he he's capable of putting on a an act really for people and um just talking about your guys kind of backgrounds because you know I was reading up that you know you guys I feel like your role in sport has been more in cricket because you guys both worked on the edge cricket documentary Felix you obviously do the brilliant uh, tail enders cricket podcast part host that I mean what was the what was it like sort of transitioning from cricket into tennis did you kind of take any learnings from kind of working in cricket or what did you learn new from getting into tennis I don't even know guys what are your backgrounds in tennis do you have you ever ever played or have you been following it I mean I mean I can't speak for Barney but I have very little background in tennis I do I, mm. like everybody else I watch it every summer you know and enjoy that and that's about the uh, amount of it mm-hmm. but I thought what was interesting about taking this on is because we've done the edge with Barney obviously mm-hmm. a, mm-hmm. a huge success of that on Barney's side was getting deeply human flawed stories out of all these alpha male characters that you would have and people had never mm. heard before and it, like it being able to sort of transcend transcend beyond cricket and people that went into the arts or people who were just living were like really interested in the story because everyone had an affinity with it mm-hmm. so moving on to the Macamo film I think that's something that Barney's been able to take to the next level but with a character that everybody has an opinion on and everybody has some preconceived notion or kind of relationship with from a distance and I think that sort of helped in a lot of ways in a cinematic sense because if if we'd maybe been too fanatical about tennis in a sort of analytical way we might have missed what the human side of this story was and what sort of the, the, you know what it's all about and, and why John behaved the way he did and how his life panned out so mm. I think that was probably the strength really I don't know if Barney would agree or disagree with that but I think that's really of the approach yeah I think certainly for me it it felt like a, a good thing I wouldn't be too bogged down in the kind of minutiae of tennis and would try and make this broadly mm. appealing to people you don't need to know the sport to to enjoy the film um mm. and want it starts out as a yeah a story almost a story about this tennis player and it ends up a a story about a man and I think that's that's really what I was trying to achieve essentially um and I do feel that not being bogged down in maybe yeah things that tennis fans might have felt overly were really key to like yeah. McEnroe's story enabled us to um bring a fresh approach to it really um I also think for John himself he's gone over and over tennis stuff you know he he was more engaged with the human side and the universal themes of the mm. film and family and um you know acceptance and grief and all that kind of thing it's interesting you talk about that because again our, after watching it with with my uh, co-host kim you know we spoke about the fact that i feel like everyone knows jock McEnroe, particularly you know for that tie break at wimbledon back in you know 1980 and they know him as a hot-headed sort of person and and that story has, has been told time and time again and it's like it what I liked about the the documentary was how you you had yes you had that on court sort of aspect but you had the off court aspect as well and it brought that sort of new element that new sort of lens to looking at John McEnroe that I don't think many people you know really know about because as I said because you know Felix you're speaking about they've just got this perception of him that he's like this hot-headed guy 
but the documentary i think really brings slight actually he's quite a you know there's more dimensions there than just that absolutely i think he's he's quite shy and reserved in a lot of ways which <laughs> a lot of people would be shocked to hear um <laughs> and i think a lot of people certainly audience reactions limited screens that we've done so far mm. um, audience reactions people are like quite surprised they're like oh i actually quite like him at the end you know like yeah. people have gone in thinking like oh, i'm going to be entertained but i'm, I'm going to hate this guy and actually i think when you start to shine different lights on him and, and as you say like come at him from different dimensions you start to realize that the, the, the anger or the outbursts are one facet of this man and particularly a, a younger man as well um, you know and i think that's i'm really kind of proud of that that because mm -hmm. i think that was quite challenging to yeah which not not try and change opinions on john McEnroe, but just it naturally to evolve over the course of a film really i thought that as well when i first watched the film before i'd sort of done music with it i thought that was what like one of its like proper triumphs was that you know we you know when you if you've lived a proper life you're going to be full of contradictions and john on top of that is quite a complex passionate person and i think the film didn't attempt to like neaten it out and be like okay this is this and this and this means this at the end at the end you know he talked about that situation with his dad where he felt like maybe his whole career potentially was just searching for something he wanted his dad to say something to him and not sure what it was which he sort of never got from him so you had it mm. you leave the film with a kind of um a genuine sense of like oh that's what living's really like you know everything doesn't get mm. tied up all the time and he was i think it was a privilege really but he was brave enough to say that all on camera you know and, and let that go on the screen yeah, it's, it's interesting you talk about that. I mean, Felix, talk about it from like the kind of music perspective, because we've just spoken about John McEnroe. He's a multidimensional guy. I really enjoyed, I think, in the cinema, particularly the music really oh, kind yeah. of helps. <laughs> it's like really, 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 really good. It's it's moody. It's atmospheric. Um, and it really, I think, plays into the, you know, the, the emotions, obviously, that, that you see visually kind of on the screen. I mean, how do you approach, obviously, from your, your background, you know, being in a, in, a, in a music band, in a rock band, how do you approach kind of taking that and applying it to kind of a, a sports documentary against someone that has these sort of multifacets to their behaviour? It's an interesting question. I think it's something I'm still kind of working out mm. and the, the fact that, like sort of but you basically just alluded to really is that I'm from a sort of band rock band background and John actually loves guitar music. So the temptation could have been to like make a, a score that sort of just fits yeah. in that world. But like having been delivered it and spoken to stuff with Barney for ages, it just felt like cinematically it was, we were just trying to be much, much more ambitious than that. And like you say, make it feel like a real mm. big green thing. So like you're in for a ride for two hours mm -hmm. and so there a few challenges there. One of them was like you were talking about the tie break at Wimbledon, that kind of thing. Everybody in the cinema would have seen those those games, you know, those moments like many times. Mm. And the job there really was just sort of to make it feel like you're watching it for the very first time, which wasn't like wasn't an easy thing to do. But but once it had been loaded with that, like we were talking about that the film was actually tender and melancholic and you were really seeing inside literally sometimes of the animation inside John's head. Mm -hmm. It was like a vehicle to sort of really explain that with the music. And then as 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 the film goes on and you get that sense of claustrophobia that fame especially mm, yeah. had at that time. I really enjoyed the sort of um really taking it there, man. So just like dissonant strings and really just like just enjoyed the idea that if you're in a cinema watching that and I see you're gonna have that sense of seriously feel like literally feel that sense of tension mm. with like no simps and like creepy strings and weird guitars and all that kind of thing yeah i think it's really key that like all those elements of a film like elevate it and i think that's what the music and the sound design really do you want people to feel as close as you can to how john is feeling at a particular time basically um you know and i think that's what felix did really manage which is not easy <laughs> um yeah so I, I, it's definitely one of the elements that i'm super proud of for sure mm. uh, yeah definitely and I, I you know i would tell our, our listeners like if you get the opportunity go see it in the cinema yeah. because as i said the the sound it really kind of comes through in that environment i mean just just talking about the you know mat you know, matching it up director to composer how how does that happen i mean felix are you just like in the in the studio waiting for, 
for Barney to like send you the footage. The and, phone. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, make me some, make me some music for this. Or do you kind of do it more collaboratively than that? Well, we'd spoken about it um, once Barney had spoken to John a few times and like, we were like, okay, we're doing this. <clears throat> Barney had an idea. So Barney had the template of um, John walking through New York late at night which it so turned out was during a pandemic when they released restrictions a little bit. So you could go over and film, literally film the deserted streets of New York, which was incredible cinematic device. And Barnard set up that framework. So we sort of knew what the feeling of it was going to be, but it wasn't mm. until the conversations with John took place that like, I'm sure Barney will tell you, but that whole thing of his dad opened up, that wasn't something that had been documented at all until Barney had those conversations with John. So the film sort of, in terms of the story, like happened in real time really, didn't it? While you were making it. And then in yeah. terms of, in terms of the music, I was, I, we hadn't, so we had an idea of like some of the music we liked and some of the films that we thought it would be cool if it sort of referenced like heat and stuff. But, uh, and then other than that, as I've learned as a musician, it's quite good to have, a, to know what you use, to work out what the template is of the palette. And then mm -hmm. once you've got that, try and do it as instinctively as possible, because that's usually when the good stuff happens. Yeah, we definitely communicated like we sent old vinyls, like ordered vinyl for each other and like sent tracks back and forth and stuff that we we had had the tone or a particular instrument or a sound that we really liked. And I would be sort of telling Felix like the colours that it would sound like and stuff <laughs> <laughs> and make him like try and work it out from there. Um, and just and just really i think tone and atmosphere was so like key for us and also mm. i mean I, it probably broke out of this a little bit but we were also like quite keen for a long time of a really limited amount of instruments weren't we we were kind of like let's try and really control mm. what we use um and not yeah get too big with it and just let the use like a keyboard and a guitar and a bait and like just really keep it mm. a bit 80s I mean, in a way yeah like indie 80s in a way so um yeah, it probably got a bit bigger than that in the end. But <laughs> I'm surprised John McEnroe didn't want to play guitar himself oh, on, the song, well. on the soundtrack. I don't know if he wanted to. Then we talked about early stages. It, it, early stages, it was, it was, it was definitely mentioned on the cards. Oh, look, I think we'd have definitely like got a few like if he's just like some crashing away on guitar somewhere in there if we could have worked it out. But <laughs> getting that recorded and you know, mm. like, as you probably aware, like once you get towards the business end of a film soundtrack it, it was pretty quite difficult overseas mm. and things like that but um it was mooted a few, a few times definitely <laughs> there was definitely in terms of the guitar playing though there was definitely like i was keen to have a few moments of like you know there's there's the odd guitar solo or sort of like inverted commas guitar hero type moment because it felt like you couldn't make a macamore film without having that in. <laughs> definitely and uh we've got a few we've got a few listener questions but before i get on to them just one final question i mean watching the documentary as well i think you realize what's so you know compelling about the story is that he's like a cultural icon in the sense that people inside and outside of tennis know him and that is reflected in some of the guests that speak throughout the documentary for example Keith Richards from the Rolling Stones uh, I didn't even know he liked tennis I, I had no, I had no yeah. idea I mean what what was your you know, kind of getting this sort of footage hearing these sorts of opinions the more these kind of came from you know, people inside tennis but outside tennis as well what was kind of your um yeah what, what were your kind of thoughts on on John McEnroe through the perspective of other people talking about him cool. Yeah, well, I think you you touched on it. Like he was a in during that period of time, he was a cultural icon. He transcended the sport in a way that probably sports stars had never done before. Um, and we wanted to give, do that a little bit of justice and just just give a sense of the the size that he was at that time. You know, because people now mm. are sort of being introduced to McEnroe now, or maybe just heard him through commentary or stuff like that. Probably not have any idea that he was hanging out with. David Bowie and Tina Turner and Keith mm, Richards and, yeah. and all this kind of stuff. And that they viewed him as this a rock star on the court type thing. So he wanted to give a, a sense of that for sure. And it's definitely part of the fun, the fun journey up, you know, uh, in his career. Um, and it really broadens, yeah, his world, I think. And um, John certainly was keen for to Keith to get a little bit of a, little bit of a, a mention mm. in the film and just get a few grabs from him because yeah i mean he is an icon isn't he so yeah. um i mean it was a say. big part of tennis back in the day it's not really something i mean the modern sportsman it just it just doesn't feel like 
is so far removed from that era and it's great to have that it being brought to life it? yeah, yeah it, exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah and i think i think it just goes back to what we said earlier on in this chat which was characters you know human emotion you know real mm. genuine reaction and like and crowd involvement and all that kind of stuff it felt much more exciting and a little bit dangerous because people were who they were they weren't mm. So they weren't manipulated into being a certain way. They weren't controlled a certain way. They just were as they were. And I think mm. now, obviously, sport in all sports, not just tennis, but you know, that's kind of been uh, manicured out of it, so we speak. There's a lot more, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a business, and you know, mm. and uh, and I think that at John's time, it was kind of like still one foot in the amateur world and one foot in the professional world in so yeah. many ways. Okay, well. I've got one final listener question uh, for you. Um, it's from Tom, and he has asked if Barney and Felix were to team up for a doubles match. Oh, what a question! Who who would be their dream opponents? Wow, do they have to be tennis players, or can it be? Anyone they don't. From... No, if if that gives you a better shot at winning, I'm That's happy. A great for, I'm happy to. Uh, I'm happy for them not to be tennis players. <laughs> well, you do you do yours, Felix, and I'll. I'll... I mean, I'd actually quite like to have John on the other side of the net, to be honest. <laughs> I, if you choose John, I'm going to have Vitas Garolaitis. <laughs> oh, Vitas. Yeah, no, God bless him. That is that just more cool. for the night out afterwards? Yeah, that would be pretty huge. Exactly. <laughs> but actually, I'll tell you what, actually, they have to have had the night out. We're playing in the morning, but me and Barney yeah. are fresh. And um, like... Yeah, that, I mean, that would be amazing. I'm just trying to think of any others that maybe we could actually compete with phoenix i don't know i don't know it's, it's an amazing bit in a film where um during right in the peak of john's fame he ends up having sort of charity and celebrity doubles matches against meatloaf yes <laughs> and again god rest his soul we probably need a few that are still around yeah. maybe um but, um right come on i need to come up with something better than yeah that. yeah you um, do i'm gonna give you a countdown and whatever comes into your head i'm keen to hear it so five four three two one cliff richard and james anderson oh, oh wow wow <laughs> joe, joe, who else? <laughs> i thought of you uh is it right is it yana novotna who cried yana novotna mm-hmm. yep. yeah can yeah. you answer this for me because my brain went for some reason went back to that moment because <laughs> beating Steffi graf and then she she um she like fell apart in the final set mm. and she had a doubles final the same day or the next day oh that's brutal did so you want win- to play her after she's lost the Wimbledon final is what you're saying anything I want to just know did she win that doubles final because I, I my brain just went I didn't yeah I'm you're probably probably right I feel <laughs> I feel like you're right um I mean last 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 question um oh, this is yeah. from this is from me and Kim it's a question we ask all of our guests you know we you know, we have a global audience, but we are at heart a British tennis podcast. And as a result of that, we have to ask all our guests, how do you take your tea? What's your what's your tea game like? Or do you even drink tea? Are you more of a coffee person? We we need to we need to know the answer. Well, absolutely tea, without doubt. Milk, sugar, uh, what what sort just of just milk what's your setup? Yeah. Just milk. Uh tea bag first, or ideally tea leaves, if we want to go <laughs> proper. Um yep. bro- in a in a, um, in a teapot mm-hmm. that's a good strength pour okay. in uh, like a deep golden oh color um and obviously milk but i don't want milky tea i want a, a really strong mm. strong full-bodied flavor <laughs> that's Felix. Me. great great answer wow i didn't realize it's gonna go so in such detail i've um I'm I'm actually like I'm on I'm fueled by caffeine at all times. So I'm right re- if I can't do anything without a cup of tea. So like even for doing this, let's have a cup of tea. <laughs> what have you got at the moment? Functioning. Okay, so at the moment I think this is just PG tips, which I have about four or five PG tips a day at least. Ooh, okay. So I'm on caffeine quite a lot. I've got a rule though, no caffeine after six PM. Is that right? Yeah. Because yeah, yeah, after that then that's the cut off time. Yeah, I've got very British <laughs> I love it I love it guys thanks so much for coming on to the podcast to talk about the McEnroe documentary I believe it's in cinemas next week yes um, where 
so so where where can people watch it because we have listeners all around the world uh, in the uk and in the united states where where can they watch the film so in the uk and ireland it's most major cities listings will be on mackinroe-film.com mm-hmm. and on the twitter at mackinroe film globally i don't know quite yet i know that there's release plans but i'm not sure they've been announced okay. yet um so we'll have to wait on that. But certainly in the UK, lots of cinemas. And I'm not quite sure when this podcast goes out, but there is also a, um, a special preview screening on Wednesday, the 13th of July in London with a Q&A with me and Felix. So that should be a really cool night. So um, that's at the Mayfair Curzon in London. So okay. Again, okay, if you go to the website, there'll be tickets. Thank you for that. Thanks so much for coming on, listeners. We'll put the links in the description. So if you want to go see the McEnroe documentary, then I would recommend to check it out. Really, really insightful piece on John McEnroe, cultural icon, both on the court and off the court. Barney, Felix, it's been great having you on. Really, really appreciate your time to come onto the Tennis Weekly podcast at Tennis Weekly HQ. Pleasure. Really, really appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for having us. <laughs> no worries uh, listeners remember to subscribe to tennis weekly on whatever device you listen to us on to stay up to date on all the action in the tennis world we're on apple Podcasts, spotify and all good podcasting platforms out there you can also listen to us on the download tennis.com app and if you like what you're hearing then make sure to leave us a rating and comments on apple Podcasts or spotify you can follow us on social media at tennis weekly pod on facebook instagram and twitter you can email the show tennisweeklypod at gmail.com or check out our website www.tennisweekly.co.uk but in the meantime we are going to be wrapping up this episode of film club and we hope to see you again soon